So can digital currencies really coexist seamlessly with fiat-based currencies and other payment systems? Absolutely. We've been able to validate that in a very flexible way. I'm your host, Dipesh Patel. I'm Tom Shack. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for SWIFT. Welcome to Trade Finance Talks, your go-to trade, treasury and payments podcast brought to you by TFG. Welcome back to Trade Finance Talks, New Year, New Podcast. My name's Dipesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global. We're preparing for BAF's inaugural edition of their International Trade and Payments Conference on the 27th through to 29th of February in Washington, D.C. Ahead of the conference, which will bring together thought leaders, trade professionals and payments experts, we caught up with one of the keynote speakers, Tom Shack, Chief Innovation Officer at SWIFT. How do we balance payment regulation with innovating cross-border B2B transactions? What's in stock for digital payments in 2024? ISO 20022, uneven payments regulation, fiat currencies and CBDCs. That's right, we're talking to no other than SWIFT's Chief Innovation Officer about the current state of cross-border payments and what could be in stock for 2024. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me today. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about these these items and topics today. Thank you, and thanks for joining us from uh, from from New York. So, quick question, elevator pitch: Who are you? Where are you from? And what do you do? I'm Tom Shack. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for Swift. I'm based in New York, and uh, even though we're a European headquartered uh, company, uh, I do most of my work from New York, but obviously travel around a lot. I've been in this role. Actually, this is the start of my fifth year in this role. So uh, we've been at it for um, for some time. And it's a really uh, super interesting company and a super interesting time in the industry. Thank you very much, Tom. So I'm going to split the podcast into two sections. Firstly, talking about some of those uneven regulations across the payments landscape. And then we're going to discuss central bank digital currencies because there are lots of really exciting things going on there. So, so first of all, I think finding that trade-off and balance between innovation and regulatory challenges is, is is quite difficult, particularly with what we saw last year across digital islands, trade payments, but also sanctions challenges, a financial crime, etc. Tom, what's the impact of uneven regulation in the payments landscape, particularly on fintech companies, and especially given those G20 goals, which aim to enhance the speed cost, transparency, choice, and access of cross-border payments? I think that's an excellent place to start because it really is about balance and trade-offs. And um, and so we see that in, 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 in virtually everything that we do. And this is a large, you know, important part of the the, the drivers for, for innovation. But let me start by saying we, we really welcome the establishment of the G20 goals in, in 2020 to enhance cross-border payments. Um, it's good to have goals. It's good to have targets. It really enables the financial community um, to focus on improving the key aspects uh, of things that really matter for for businesses and and consumers for international payments. So we, we we think it's we think it's fantastic, and and we've made really good progress in this in this area. Uh, we want measurable targets. We want to be able to demonstrate progress. You know, again on kind of the, the key aspects, and in 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 some of the cases. Um, you know, we've we've already made really good progress across our community uh, with banks and financial institutions. You know, so for example, today, um, eighty nine percent of transactions processed on our network reach the recipient bank within an hour. So that's well within the you know, the speed target set by the Financial Stability Board or the FSB to achieve one hour processing for seventy five percent of international payments by twenty twenty seven. So so. Um, We've taken this uh, these targets very, very seriously, and their priorities to us, uh, and we're making good progress in 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 on, on some of those targets already. But with that said, there's still a lot to be done, and and as as you um, had said, the the impact of regulation I think is sometimes kind of underplayed in terms of um, speed and cost and the friction that it creates in in, in cross border payments. N- not intentionally, just kind of as a consequence of of uh, of really kind of the. The, the the complex web of regulations, you know that financial institutions and banks um, have to have to comply with, and rightfully so, um, and they and they differ, you know, in some cases pretty regularly or pretty pretty big differences between country and countries. Um, 
country to country, I should say. And so, you know, these rules and and and, and complying with the laws and the rules uh, really does create uh, some friction in cross border payments. So let let me give you one example. Um, and there and there's several. You know, the screening for sanctions and financial crimes um, need to be checked in some cases multiple times depending on the jurisdictions. And so anytime you have to do, do things more than once, you know, it's going to create, it's going to create fr- friction. So what, what doesn't get talked about probably enough is, is really kind of the compliance cost um, that's really resource intensive to be able to c- comply with the law and to, and to be able to follow these rules. And of course, you know, everybody wants to do that, um, but, it's, but it's expenses and it's labor intensive. We, we saw a report last year from Lexis Nexus that said, and made an estimate that global financial institutions spend more than $200 billion annually in their efforts to, to combat financial crime. Half of that is labor cost. So these are really, really substantial numbers. So again, it's not just the friction, but the cost of compliance actually drives up the cost of, of doing business. And so, there, you know, again, we, we welcome these targets and we're working actively with our community to tackle these compliance challenges and, and, and develop a number of solutions that our financial institutions and the community can use to, to not only meet the requirements but, but, uh, and, and tackle financial crime, but really kind of do it in a much more efficient way as well. Thanks, Tom. Good, good point. And, and, and actually that sanction screening piece is something that's brought up time and time again. And, you know, it is really important, but there is a cost, of course, of, of doing this. I think another piece here is, is, is the issues around formatting and data errors when it comes to cross-border transactions. I mean, I mean, Swift, you, you said yourselves that, that, that 72% of, of, of some of the errors when analyzing payments exceptions across your network were as a result of formatting issues, account issues, and invalid data. Tom, how is Swift working with its community to overcome some of these challenges? Yeah, so so the the analysis that we did, the reports we've published, you know, it's, it's really clear that data quality uh, needs to be addressed, right? In terms of the formatting uh, errors, in terms of validating uh, the the beneficiary accounts, all these sort of things. So it's a priority for us. It's a priority for our banks, and again, kind of leading to those targets these are these are kind of things that need to be resolved if we want to make progress against the <clears throat> against the targets so in um i think there's probably kind of two aspects to this in uh the first part of last year in march of last year um the industry actually uh and successfully kicked off the migration to a new payment standard the iso 2022 uh, payments message standard for for cross border payments and reporting and so you know with that um, and with the new data standard that we have, the quality of the data, the richness of the data is really is really um, improved. And so uh, financial institutions can improve the customer experience with richer information. You know, they can do things like like uh, invoice reconciliation um, in a much more uh, automated way. So remove that manual intervention um, or investigate payments more 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 clearly or better understand kind of the profile of their customers. And the, and, the, and the kind of the way and the context and the, and the nature in the which payments are being made. So, so that's a migration that started. Um, it's, we're, we're making good progress on that and, and kind of enabling that and, and facilitating that with, with the community. Um, but there's other things that need to be done as well. And so the, the second part, I would say, is, is really kind of developing products and services that actually help to improve data quality and catch errors even before they become a problem on the network. And so um, we've recently um, launched a payment pre-validation solution that, that allows the, our financial institutions to really um, reduce the risk of, re- of rejected payments or missing or incorrect data before the payment's instructed. And so we're trying to manage th- this proactively. Um, you know, we, we do have a really unique source of data in our community with over 11,500 financial institutions. And this pre-validation service that we offer is is available via a state-of-the-art um, API technology to really, uh, uh, again, allow the financial institutions and the banks to verify the accuracy of the data and the, the, input, the input into the payment instructions before they're sent. And so we, we, we think, and we've seen really good um, results on that already. It, 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 the adoption takes time. Uh, to get this worked in, you know, at scale, but the kind of the early results of that are, are, are really good. Um, the other thing that I would mention 
related to kind of products and capabilities is that we've kind of started on our journey with AI and more specifically machine learning, to develop technologies and capabilities to really detect anomalies or things that are not normal in terms of payment flow across the network and look for errors uh, in the data and look for operational problems or look for even signs of, of fraud and payments. So, so we've kicked off that journey. Uh, we've done a lot of experimentation um, on our own and a lot of development. And, and, and this year we'll be kicking off work with our banks uh, to really uh, try to uh, coalesce and focus on, on things like uh, financial fraud uh, in, the, in, in the payments industry. Hey, enjoying this podcast? Hit that follow button for more. Done? Let's get back to it. Thank you very much, Tom. So I think the three three things that are important to note there, you know, supporting that transition from from sending traditional M- MT messages towards that ISO twenty zero two two adoption journey, the launch of payment pre validation, and 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 why it's important to really target and 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 combat typos and and formatting errors up front, and finally, and something supported by our twenty twenty four. Uh, predictions is 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 how AI can really be used to help detect some of those anomalies, reduce fraudulent payments, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's that's really that's really important to note, especially as we've seen the huge rise of of central bank digital currencies, which which we're going to talk about in the second half of this this podcast. Because I think it's fair to say that 2023 was really the year of billions of dollars of value creation through the tokenization of assets and CBDCs. Can you tell us a bit more about SWIFT's role in this world, Tom? Yeah, I, I certainly will. And, and this is probably a, a good example of where, you know, balance and trade-offs need to be deployed, right? What, what have we learned from the past and how do we make sure that what we're building for the future doesn't create kind of the same problems we have, whether that's around fragmentation or around data quality or, or, or anything else, you know, as we, as we embark on these um, new digital assets and, and digital currencies. So, I mean, 2023, you know, to say that the, the um, enthusiasm and the progress being made, not only for central bank digital currencies, but for tokenized assets, um, uh, the acceleration of that in 2023 was, was significant. And we thought 2022 was was a, was a busy year, um, but but it just seems to continue to increase in terms of interest and and the amount of um, effort that's being uh, that's being put forward, you know, to develop some and explore some of these 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 new kind of digital assets. Um, we follow the Atlantic Council's CBDC tracker, uh, and they they're currently reporting over 130 <clears throat> countries that are doing some kind of um, development work or exploration work related to CBDC. Sees. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's virtually everywhere. And, and, and in terms of the, the global interest for tokenization, um, you know, the, it, it's really kind of intensified uh, across the industry. Um, and there's lots of um, potential there that, that um, are, have people really, really interested and excited about, um, you know, some really significant value that could be, that could be added. Now, I should say in terms of Swiss role and the, and, and, and the work that we're doing, we're, we're not in a position of advocacy. Um, we, 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 um, our, our view on this is, is really for, you know, if, and when a digital currency or a digital asset is created, you know, our focus is really to say, how do we work with our community? So you can leverage these new networks, so you can leverage the new assets and, and how can you, um, use that to service your customers better at scale in a safe and reliable way and the things you expect from, from, from the SWIFT network. So we're not in an advocacy position. So our, our, our approach is really kind of if and when uh, they happen. And I think that the, one of the shifts we see in 2023 is that the, the sediment in the industry is kind of when it's going to happen as opposed to if it's going to happen. And when we started looking at, and we've done this for, for several years now, um, we started our work uh, a few years back in 2021 on, 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 on CBDCs. Um, we started looking at this, you know, we saw a real opportunity to, to create additional fragmentation, um, you know, with different different assets between central banks and, and, and other creators of digital assets. So the technologies, the platforms, even the regulatory environments, which you, which you touched on before, they're different. And so what we decided to do is we really decided to say our role should be really anchored on the ability to provide interoperability between these new digital asset networks and existing payment rails and the way in which really the, the, the world moves value today. Uh, it's a big challenge 
for the for the community. Uh, it's a big challenge for the world, um, but there's also a great opportunity for us to kind of build things properly the first time around and, and not have a conversation five years from now, which is how do you deal with the fragmentation and the data quality related to new digital assets, right? So we could uh, we could definitely uh, we can definitely get ahead of that with the work that we're doing. Thanks, Tom. And I think that comes back to 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 you know the 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 real ethos behind Swift, which is really connecting some of those disparate networks, be that you know payment, digital currencies, etc., who are moving value ar- around the world. Could you tell us a little bit about the CBDC? interoperability interlinking experiments that you've continued to conduct throughout 2023 yeah and and it really was building on the work that we did in 2022 um and we developed an experimental interlinking solution that really connected you know uh, new uh, cbdc networks with the existing payment rails really being kind of technology um, agnostic and 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 knowing that you know Swift's not going to set the standard for that. Nobody's going to set the standard for that. Um, but what we need to do is figure out how could we deploy standards and how could we provide interoperability um, between these new networks and and existing payment rails. So in early 2023, we we kind of road tested a solution. And solution might be too strong of a word, but um, we actually proposed to 18 central banks and commercial banks. Um, uh, our solution for interlinking, uh, which is which is different than kind of a unified ledger approach, and I think it's fair to say we we don't know which which uh, uh, approach is going to win out. If, if maybe both of them will win out, uh, but there's kind of two different ways in which um, most people in the financial community are thinking about the introduction of digital assets and digital currencies. Um, our focus is on the interlinking solution, and again, anchored on interoperability between existing payment rails and and the potentially new networks. So we got together with the 18 central banks and commercial banks. We put it into a sandbox and allowed us to kind of uh, validate, explore, um, assess, you know, and really kind of collaborate to improve our solution. You know, we've kind of taken this as far as we can ourselves and, and we're in this really kind of unique position to coalesce and bring the industry together to try to figure these things out at a very detailed level the feed the feedback from the sandbox was was really strong and very encouraging um uh you know the positive results that we had said you know keep going we want to do more um there's kind of a, a wide range of things that we can we can do with this and ways to, to implement it uh and we want you to do more uh with us and 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 we continued on in in, uh, in 2023 as well thank you tom so what's next for your cbdc work at swift so, so we're going. We're 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 in the process. We started this towards the end of last year, but we really need to use what we built in terms of interlinking solution, and 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 the, I think there's kind of two two primary work streams that come out of that. One is really using this this um, solution that we've built by the central banks to be able to integrate our CBDC connector solution into their test networks. So these are real end to end cross border test between central banks through our platform using the interlinking solution and 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 we do have we do have central banks that are that are testing that now uh we do have central banks that that will be you know talking about their own results and 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 the conclusions um that they found in doing this testing the hong kong monetary authority or hkma the national bank of uh, kazakhstan you know they're doing real testing and real direct testing in the sandbox environment the second thing that we're doing is really um, diving deeper into what we're calling the phase two of the CBDC sandbox. So we've built for more complex use cases. So really interesting use cases around, you know, trigger payments um, that could be related to trade finance for DVP related to securities uh, settlement, for example. And so that's all been put into the sandbox. We're working through those use cases now. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to report as well, in the second phase of this, we have over 30 financial institutions that are working with us on this. Um, and that's market infrastructures, that's commercial banks, that's central banks. So so again, the, the take up of this and, and the position that we have here to kind of work through real solutions and real tests and real experiments, you know, with our industry is, is, um, has been, has been really, really well received and we're making good, uh, good progress on that front. Um, so we'll go deeper on additional use cases and we'll just continue to iterate with our, our community and kind of the activity that we have with, um, so many people in that community. So can digital currencies really coexist seamlessly with fiat based currencies and other payment systems? 
Absolutely. We've been able to validate that in a very flexible way. Again, not knowing what the actual end solutions look like, but yeah, there's there, we've been able to validate with our community that we'll be able to provide um, solutions that connect existing payment rails to, to new digital networks. Thank you very much, Tom. Lots to keep up with. And 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 look to our to our readers and to our listeners to find out more. It's it's definitely worthwhile checking out the BAFT International Trade and Payments Conference, which is going to be held in Washington, DC, February the 27th to, to 29th, where, where Tom is one of the keynote speakers. Tom, thank you very much for joining us on Trade Finance Talks. It's been such a pleasure having you. Look forward to seeing you in Washington. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to the uh, to the conference.